talking about adult learning and adult learners, and I just want to quickly refresh our minds and brainstorm again for a second. What is special about teaching and working with adults? It's adults are very motivated. Motivated. Self-motivated. They are choosing to come to a theater session. What else? They have more demands on their time and attention than a younger learner would have. Earlier education experience that they are bringing with them. Maybe not feeling successful in their previous education, or not finishing school, or dealing with second language learners. They probably studied in their country in a different way than they here, so they're really back with them. Their expectations of the old teacher, where the student should I talk in class, how should I address the teacher, you know, all of these things that they're bringing with them. working with adults and being friends. The big word that pops up right away is goals. goals. Students come to you, come to a tutoring session with goals, specific needs and reasons that they are coming to class. Right? Goals are really important because they will affect the content that you choose to teach in your class. They will affect the materials that you use, um, what you and the students do with the materials in, in the session, and students' motivation and sense of progress. If they don't feel like they are working towards their goal, then they might not feel like they're making any progress. And, and a lot of times, and we'll get into this a little bit, the role, a lot of times they don't know what their goals are. Or they know what the long-term goal is, but they actually don't know how to break a goal down into, into little steps. Or they don't know what is needed to reach that goal. And that is really, um, I think, such an important part of tutoring and teaching. Um, I, I run into this every single day at my job. I, I run into things with uh, students having a goal and feeling like what we're doing in class maybe isn't relevant to their goal and at 20 students and my job is to find a way to show well it is relevant to your goal in a way that you might not think and then making sure i find out what that person's goal is and trying to address that in the, in the future as well so this is something we talk about constantly reason someone might come to a tutoring class you know, you hear all the time, oh, I come, if you're an ESL tutor, why do you come to class so to learn English? It's very general, you know, to learn English. Well, that, that's a very, very big goal. And if you have that goal, and that's what a student says their goal is, they might never feel like they've reached that goal. Because we know learning a language is a lifelong process. So if the goal is just learning English, they're going to feel frustrated for a long time because they never get... To, to, to reach it. So we need to break that down to hopefully get them to be a little more specific. You can see things down here. Sometimes a student might say to speak fluently, to speak correctly, to be able to read, to learn more vocabulary. Okay, these are just general, general goals. And then I, I go a little bit more specific to improve my spelling. Maybe someone wants that. Or to prepare to go to college, to get a different job, okay, to be able to help children with homework. So these are the things we're starting to, we're starting to get more specific. If you just take a quick look at these goals on here, do you have any questions about any of them? Anything that stands out or any that look familiar to you? So for the few students that come from our program, a lot of these goals fall into what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. Be able to communicate with teachers and doctors and mm -hmm. help the kids with homework. Many of our students come from other countries, our ESL students, and they have advanced degrees, but because of their limited English proficiency, they're working at lower wage jobs than they feel that they should be qualified for. So when they become more proficient in English, they see the difference. Mm -hmm. They're able to be hired in a, in a better position. Mm -hmm. I had a student that was a surgical nurse technician in Argentina, and she desperately wants to do something like that again. And she, she had, had a low level of English when she came here. She married an American man, and she lives in Middletown. And she... Um, she recently, she got her level up high enough. So that's her long-term goal is to do that job here. But in the, in the meantime, the shorter goal is to be able to do something like volunteering in the healthcare field. And she was able to get her um, speaking skills up enough and she's now volunteering at Middlesex Hospital. And she's sort of a runner. She, she brings flowers to people's rooms and gives directions. And, and she said, I feel 
feel like a fish in water again. You know, I just, for so long, I just felt, she was in this country, she was so unhappy, and now she just feels like it's all making sense again, even though she's a ways away from her, from her main goal. But um, we can break it down into smaller steps. Students come in, they're very motivated, and they come in with these ideas of, of really what they, what they want to learn, how to address that without, um, because there's a lot of theory that shows if you can, if someone will correct things when they're ready to correct it. You can kind of, until you're blue in the face, try to get someone to pronounce something correctly, and it, it, it you know, it could be, end up being very frustrating for someone. Or if you stop, you know, you, you stop someone when they're trying to tell you a story, you stop them to correct the pronunciation, you're just stopping, 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 then the person never wants to talk. So knowing the students, what their expectations are, that you're going to, um, the students have the expectation that you're going to correct everything, and I need to correct English, and then you have a discussion. Well, okay, I will, I, this is how I'm going to do it. I'm not going to stop you every single time you make a mistake, but I'm going to keep track and, and maybe write down some of the things, and then we'll go over it at the end of class, because that could end up taking, and if she wants you to correct what everybody else is saying, Everyone else is going to stop talking pretty quickly, probably. You're too big for that. So, but respecting the fact that they are adults and discussing that, you know, um, and that's something we'll talk about a little bit, a little bit later. We might work in a program where it says, like, this week we're going to talk about transportation, and we um, start to do lessons on the bus. And okay, transportation, the bus. And then we find out that the person never uses the bus, or the person isn't planning on living here for a long time, and they're just here visiting and they need something specific. So um, it really should be at the beginning of a, um, of a session when you first meet students, you know, to have a class discussion. That's a great way to do it. Um, does anybody use any sort of um, form? You have a form that you've made, that you've created, and what's on the form? transportation, housing, jobs, etc. And then I ask them to list their priorities. Um, there are about, you know, uh, 10 different topics to list their priorities. So that's something that I recommend. Um, and, and with goals, a lot of times what I struggle with, a lot of us are working with groups of students where it's, it's different all the time. <laughs> you kind of, okay, I know what your goals are, and then they disappear, and then you get three new students and they have different goals and maybe they weren't there the day that we were talking about the goals. And to remember to find out from the new people. So I try to do it ongoing all the time to make it part of the lesson. Uh, what, do you, what, do you, what do you do if someone can't tell you what their goal is? Does anybody have a student like that where the level is so low that they can't tell you? Okay. And what do you do then? In that case, if they can't tell you what their goal is, then we're going to start with just like basic communication, you know, basic survival skills, and hopefully they will be able to, to tell you that. I broke it down into sort of three steps, the way that you could do a role play with like beginners, you're going to write a basic script, and I gave you an example of that on page seven. Okay. An example of just a basic, you can look at that like at a food restaurant, ordering. That would be the most beginner. Here I wrote the script for you. And then we're just going to substitute words. Instead of saying hamburger, next time I'm going to say cheeseburger. And next time I'm going, to, I'm not going to say Coke, I'm going to say water. And we're just keeping it real simple. And then if they're intermediate students, they can write their own dialogue after using this as a guide. And if they're a little more advanced, you just show them a picture of a fast food restaurant and say, go for it. What are they saying? You create it based on your own experience. And so this, if you have multi-levels in the class, you can kind of spend the beginning of class talking about the rest, the menu and, and the restaurant, and then divide them up. This is, um, I put somewhere in here, whole part, whole teaching. You have the whole group together, and then you spend part of the session catering to those different needs. Like, you know, uh, I'm going to work with the beginners here, but this student's a little more advanced. I'm going to have her sit in the corner, and she's just going to write up her own dialogue, her own script. And then I'll practice reading with it after. And these three over here are at a little different level. And so we're all going to kind of work separately. And then we're going to come back at the end and share what we did. Um, because we, I, one of the things I do, does anyone have multi-level people in your class? 
it can be challenging right, to, to meet that. It can be challenging to meet different levels, and it can be challenging when people have so many different goals. So your job is to kind of connect those pieces. What else besides goals do we need to find out, could we find out um, from students? Like, so if we're going to have a discussion or we're going to make a form, what else about them would be helpful to know before we, you know, to be, to be relevant, so we can make our lessons relevant to them as adults. So we have goals. What else would be useful information? Yes. I like to find out what they're interested in. Interests, yes. So we have goals. Interests. Find out what types of things they like to do and to talk about and what topics. Maybe you love history. Oh, it's President's Day, and you want to talk all about all the different presidents. That just might not be what your students are interested in. Um, maybe if they're, and then maybe it has nothing to do with their goal. Their goal might be if it's to become a citizen, well maybe that is relevant because it's a citizenship test. It's, it's important to know, you know, and I, I've worked, I work with a lot of teachers who love history and show, you know, historical movies all the time. How can we connect it? A lot of students stop coming because they don't want to watch the historical movie. There is a way you can connect that to a student's goal. Um, they might not realize it. So, well, it's listening practice, and you said you wanted to be able to understand native speakers, so this is a way to do it. Or we're going to watch the movie, and then you can write about it afterwards in the past tense because you need to use the past tense. So there are ways to connect these things. But a lot of times, teachers, we do what we like to do, especially if you've been doing it for a long time. You kind of, oh, I'm interested in this. I'm going to bring it in and do that. So interest, knowing what students are interested in more than what your interests are. <laughs> What else? Interest your backgrounds. Yeah, you said backgrounds. I um, often ask them to what they consider their greatest weakness mm -hmm. or problem. Mm -hmm. And I found that adults um, are very forthcoming in these things. Mm -hmm. so I had one um, student who was a doctor, and he said people at work tell them they have trouble understanding. Mm -hmm. and. It's not really pronunciation after we talked about it for a while. It's stress and rhythm, mm -hmm. which are totally different in English than what he is used to. He has a very good vocabulary, and his pronunciation is not bad at all. Mm -hmm. But it's like playing something in a different key. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, and that's why a lot of uh, with, with the uh, Indian English for example, and a lot of people will say, well, uh, I called Microsoft and they don't understand anything yes. that they say. It's like, they're speaking fluently. They're speaking fluent English, but they just the, the stress is a little right. bit different in the way that they speak. And it's the same English that I'm speaking, it's just the rhythm is a little different, and that completely changes the, the gear. So knowing about their, their perceptions about their own learning and their own weaknesses, their own strengths, their previous experience in school, maybe? Um, how long have they been learning English and what kind of environment, is, if, it's, if it's English, where did they learn that before? Um, how long have they been in this country? Um, what was school like for them? You know, all of, all of these things can be really useful in, in planning what you're going to do with, with a group and to be thinking about that all, all the time. These are real examples from my class. It sounds similar to um, what we heard earlier about somebody wanting to speak with, um, speak more fluently. She wants to speak fluently. She doesn't feel confident when speaking with native speakers on the phone. She speaks good English. She's, she knows a lot. She knows English a lot, but she doesn't feel confident doing it. So she relies on her husband and her children, even though she understands everything. She relies on them to do all of the talking. But this bothers her, especially bothers her when dealing with her children's school and the doc. What's the goal? The goal. Who, who had student group number one? I think there was two groups. Okay, so what did you guys come up with? Her biggest problem was you no know, self-confidence. Mm -hmm. She knew English, but she wanted to speak more fluently and comfortably, but yeah. she didn't believe she could. Imagine a student like this now, and then we get this um, lady's student in there who wants to correct everybody in the room, and we have this woman who's afraid of talking because she wants to be... Uh, she's, she doesn't have the confidence. These two might be in the same class, right? So how do we kind of juggle 
juggle that and address it. One way of addressing it is just making it part of the conversation and talking about it all the time. Say, okay, this is your goal to speak correctly. Your goal is to speak fluently. Here's how we're going to do this. You know, just being very explicit about it. This is this is sort of how we're going to handle these two things. Because that, if you start correcting everyone, this woman, she might just stop talking all together or be terrified and then not come back. Um, so the people in the room, they don't think that, they don't realize that there are many times, and my students say to me all the time, I didn't realize that it was so important if I came to class. Like, I know for my life, but I didn't realize it was important for you or for the other students that I'm there. It's like, well, we, we plan on this. I know that I have these two different people in the room and, I, and I'm coming to this session, and so I'm thinking about them. And if one of them doesn't show up or, you know, it matters. And so letting the students know, know that is, is important. In order to be able to feel confident and to be able to um, to talk to the child's teacher and the doctor, like what does she need to be able to do? What's the the skill we would practice? Being able to express your ideas, you know, to be able to express, to say what you. In this case, it's really just about getting those ideas out. You have all the ideas in your head. Being able to express yourself, maybe being able to use the vocabulary and the grammar that you know but how to use it for real conversation. And a way to do that with activities, role playing is great. Um, did you come up with anything else for activities? A lot of reinforcement. What I do every single day, a lot of people say, doesn't that get boring? I say, okay, you two talk together, okay? And then now you two talk together, and you two talk together, and you two talk together. And you're saying the same exact thing over and over and over again, and then now you tell me. So you said it five times, the same thing five times. And it seems, oh, isn't that boring? But it's not boring. Even if you have a group of five people, you mix up the partners a bunch of different times and say, repeat what you just said, say it again. The more you say it, the more you kind of learn to correct yourself. You feel more confident. You, you get more concise. And so just repetition, 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 talking a lot, lots of reinforcement, Role playing, um, role playing for what situations? Doctor and school. You just do it. Carl Stevick and a big teacher trainer in the TESOL field. He's one of the founders of like the TESOL field. Success in the language classroom depends less upon materials, techniques, or linguistic analyses, and more on what goes on inside and between the people in the classroom. So I'm spending all this time talking about materials and what you should do with them, but it all comes down to this idea of respect, too. When you're adults, we're working together, the relationship you have with them. You're spending the time to find out about them, to find out why they're coming. That will keep them there. You're building a relationship. You're making eye contact with them. You're connecting with them as people. They'll, they'll come. You know, they'll keep coming to class. Um, if you get up there and you just disregard all of their goals and you just talk at them and don't make an effort to get to know them, they won't come. Very important. Adults bring life experiences, knowledge, and learning experiences. We want to tap into that. We want to find out what those things are. Draw, draw from them. Adults are goal-oriented. I think I've used that word a thousand times today. Adults are relevancy-oriented. They want what they're doing to be relevant to their lives. Adults are practical. They want useful things that they can use immediately okay. when they leave the room. You teach something and then hopefully they can apply it and then they see the benefit of that and then they you know feel like they're making progress and they'll keep coming. In the world of adult education where it's open enrollment policy, students are not required to come just like literacy volunteers, persistence and uh, retention is a big problem. You know keeping the retention, keeping students coming. I really find this stuff, when you really tap into these things and give a, a huge amount of time spent on figuring out why your students are there, talking to them about it all the time, connecting everything you're doing to them by talking about skills being practiced and how will this help you in the future, and um, that will keep them coming. Life things happen and they, they disappear, but that really helps so much with it. With, uh, and attention with students. Um, and adult learners like to be stuck.